talk of the day and also of the conference. Uh, so we've got Ian Hobson here, who is the technical principal for DSP and Device at Ableton. And he's going to talk about uh, an introduction to Rust for audio developers. So please give a big hand for Ian. Hello. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool, great. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome. I'm very excited to uh, uh, be able to talk with you all today about Rust, the programming language which uh, I've been following for a few years now and I'm, I'm very interested in. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some of uh, my thoughts about it with you. Um, my goals for this talk, uh, definitely not to uh, suggest that you should drop everything and use Rust. That's uh, totally not my goal. Uh, what I am hoping to achieve is to uh, show you a brief overview of the language uh, and then give you the, the necessary entry points to be able to explore it on your own. Uh, I think it's a fun language to play with, and uh, hopefully if, 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 I, if I do this right, you'll, you'll feel uh, like uh, there's nothing stopping you from exploring it if you, if you fancy it. Uh, also, I'm going to show how you can use Rust in your existing projects, if that's something that would be interesting to you. Uh, and at the end, if we have time, I'll, I'll give a quick overview of the state of some uh, of the important features that we need in audio development. So a bit about me, uh, uh, I'm working at Ableton uh, in Berlin since 2011. As mentioned already, uh, I'm the technical principal for DSP and devices there. And <clears throat> what that means is uh, I have a dual role, essentially, where I'm working as a software engineer in the sound team, working on our instruments and effects. And uh, I'm also looking after our uh, long-term strategy for sound technology. So. It, in terms of sound technology, there isn't really anything uh, more fundamental to what we do than use C++. Uh, so why uh, am I interested in Rust? Well, like many of you, I think uh, you'll be using C++. Uh, it, it really dominates the, the music software industry. And it has since uh, the start of my career, so it, about 15 years, and there hasn't really been much choice. We've been using C++ or, or C if, if you're feeling brave, or some, somewhere on the spectrum between uh, basic C and full-blown C++ with all, all the bells and whistles. And you, you'll find some comfort zone in that spectrum of uh, C and C++. Um, did, did we have a, a choice beyond that? Uh, not really that I've, I've known about. Uh, I uh, haven't seen a viable alternative uh, in my career. Uh, I think there might have been uh, in the old days. Like Delphi, I think. <laughs> like, I, I remember seeing some code examples in Delphi when I was starting out. I haven't seen many since. <laughs> uh, if, if you use Delphi and you think it's great, then let me know. I, I'd be interested. <laughs> uh, but Rust uh, like, has uh, caught my eye, and I think it's caught a few of your eyes, too, uh, because it offers much of what I like about C++. You get low-level control, uh, high-level abstractions, uh, I, I like abstractions, uh, so I, I tend towards the C++ end of things. Uh, performance on par with C and C++. I'm not going to spend time proving this, but uh, if you allow me to wave my hands and say it's basically the same kind of performance that you get with C++, depending on how you tune things, but uh, we can just say that they're in, they're in the same ballpark. Uh, and it offers precise timing, and this is the, the thing that really has uh, stopped me from investigating a lot of languages that look attractive, but usually have garbage collection or some kind of messaging system that locks or, or something that's just in the way. Uh, so it, it's quite exciting to me that there's maybe a, a viable alternative now to C++ for real-time audio. So it, a bit about the background of Rust, for those of you who don't know, it started as a project at Mozilla. They were interested in uh, maybe finding an alternative language for building complex uh, applications like web browsers that have lots of security holes because of common programming mistakes that people uh, often make in C and C++. So this was a language that was uh, intended for maybe a, a new approach to building complex applications. It, it, they announced it publicly in 2012. Uh, got lots of other people on board now. Mozilla aren't the majority contributor. Many other people are contributing to Rust, and there's an open development process. And uh, they, they reached a stable 1.0 release in 2015, which allowed people to start using it in production, essentially, because they knew their code would continue to run as the, uh, uh, as the tool chain evolved. 
And in 2016, Mozilla managed to uh, start shipping code that was written with Rust in Firefox. And since then, the, the amount of code that is shipping in Firefox with Rust has grown, and uh, they, they seem very happy about it. Also happy about Rust are the people who vote in the Stack Overflow developer survey. And for the last three years, it has been voted the most loved language. Now, what that means exactly, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it's worth pointing out that it, this language is getting a lot of attention, a lot of mainstream traction. And so then, uh, it, to me, it seems uh, sensible for us to be thinking about it in this context, which is why I uh, suggested doing a talk about it. And uh, it, it's not really my place to give this talk, in a way. Like, I'm, I'm not a, a Rust contributor or anything. I'm not an expert, but I, an enthusiast. And I uh, thought I'd see if we could start a conversation about uh, having an alternative language to C++ here. I figured it's worth talking about. So let's get involved in a bit of Rust. Uh, here's a hello world. And you can see already that it looks quite familiar uh, to <coughs> C and C++. We've got curly braces and semicolons. We've got a function <laughs> that's been called, called main. Uh, the, the exclamation mark on the end of print line means uh, macro. And in Rust, macros are OK. They're not evil, I can see. And that prints out hello world. Very good. Uh, here's a slightly more complicated hello world. I don't know if that's maybe too big for a, no, that looks all right. OK, uh, so we call a function, get name, that returns a string, then we pass that string into another function, and then we use a formatting thing to print out hello ADC. Here's an even more complicated example, where now we're uh, using an enum. And here in Rust, enums are like C-like enums, but also like variants in C++. They, they, they are some types. And you can apply very nice uh, language-based pattern matching to destructure the, the option in the, in the enum and, and then print that out. And, and this is nice, uh, but uh, this isn't why I think Rust is interesting. It, it offers like a lot of interesting ergonomic enhancements to uh, uh, your, your programming uh, that uh, don't exist yet in C++, but maybe over time they will. Uh, we'll see what happens. I, I hope so. Uh, but that's not why I think uh, it, Rust is worth uh, investigating, really. If, if, that, if ergonomics was all it was, it wouldn't be particularly interesting, I think. Uh, but there are some fundamental properties that make Rust uh, very different to work with compared to C++. Let's take a look at what some of those properties are. This is C++, uh, C++ code. We have uh, a value A, and then we take two pointers to A. And then we uh, manipulate A via the pointers, and then we dereference the pointers to print out a value. If we do the same thing in Rust, well, uh, this is the equivalent code. Here we have a mutable value A. In Rust, everything is const by default, and you have to buy into mutability. Uh, we take two mutable references to A, then we manipulate the values, print them out. But the compiler will block you from doing this because we cannot borrow A as mutable more than once at a time. First mutable borrow occurs here, second mutable, blah, blah, blah. Uh, OK, so that's a rule that the compiler has, that you, you're not allowed more than one mutable reference. OK, what if we make the second reference immutable uh, so that we're, we're only taking one mutable reference? Well, the compiler still blocks you here. We cannot borrow A as immutable because it is also borrowed as mutable. Now, this might seem a bit restrictive, because actually there's nothing particularly wrong with that code. It's, this is a toy example, uh, but this illustrates the, the kinds of restrictions that are baked into the language. And maybe it's best spelled out in writing. The rules are <laughs> uh, you can have as many immutable references to a value as you like. You can have 1,000 if they're all immutable, or a single mutable reference. Those are your two choices, as many immutable references or one mutable reference. And also, there's a rule that values that references refer to have to outlive their references. So the lifetime of values is uh, statically tracked throughout your program. To put it another way, because maybe that's not entirely clear, we'll say it again, but in a different way. <laughs> if you want to access a value by reference, the language guarantees that the value exists. And if you want to modify a value, you must have the only reference to it. Now, in a toy example, that might not be particularly interesting or, or uh, exciting. But uh, 
If you apply those rules throughout your entire program as you build up uh, a more complex application, then these rules start to become much more important as you start uh, like doing things that uh, maybe you, uh, uh, how to put it, have unintended uh, consequences. So here's an example of a, a classic uh, uh, pitfall in C++. We have a dangling pointer. So we, we have a pointer x, which we point to the first element in a, a, a vector. The vector gets destroyed. We still have a pointer. What happens if we dereference it? Well, uh, a crash, I guess. <laughs> but certainly something you don't want to do. If you have the uh, equivalent code in Rust, so here we're uh, assigning x as a reference to the first element of a vector v. Uh, then we try and dereference it. Well, we, we can't even get to the dereferencing because the uh, lifetime checker knows that uh, v does not live long enough. And we're trying to borrow a value that does not live long enough. v gets dropped here while it's still borrowed, and the borrowed value needs to live here. And in terms of like understandable error messages, I'm not sure what they could do better there. I think it's, it's really uh, spelled out super clearly. Um, it, it's, it's quite nice. Another way uh, you can uh, shoot yourself in the foot in uh, C++ is uh, if, you have, if you're iterating over a container and then you happen to be modifying the container while you're iterating over it. So here we're uh, going over the, the integers 0, 1, 2, 3. We're printing them out. But while we're doing that, we're also manipulating the contents of the vector. Then strange things can happen. On my machine, I get 0, 0, 2, 3. I don't know why, uh, but that's what happens. Uh, maybe you would get something else. Um, if we try and do the same thing in Rust, this is the, the equivalent code. Then we get an error. Cannot borrow v is mutable because it is also borrowed as immutable. So it, like the, the mutable borrow is happening here. We're trying to push into the vector, but we can't do that because we have to, have, we have to be the sole owner to be able to mutate v. And we can't because there's already an immutable borrow active like from the iteration. Now, we, we can go a lot further with examples where uh, safety comes into play, in particular with uh, like uh, parallel uh, algorithms, where uh, like these kinds of safety checks allow you to have, uh, what, they, what do they call it, fearless concurrency or something like this. It's like you, you can write uh, threads, thread, uh, multi-threaded code uh, in a guaranteed to be safe way without really having to think about it too hard which is uh, quite refreshing and, and quite cool. And hopefully I've made the point that uh, there, there are some fundamental properties here which um, it just simply don't apply in C++. So it's worthy of attention, I think. So if you want to play around with Rust, although there are online compilers that you can try out, but if you want to install it locally, uh, you go to this website, rust.rs. Then if you're on a... If you're on Mac or Linux, then you run a shell script and you, you get a toolchain installed. If you're on Windows, you get an installer. Uh, and then you get a, a toolchain on your system. And on, on my system, I happen to have installed three. You get the stable by default. Uh, and then rustup is a command that you can run to manage your toolchain. So if you want to like see which ones you have, rustup. If you want to switch between them, then you go to rustup. And once you've installed the toolchain, then you have access to uh, the cargo command, which is very useful. Now I'm going to do a risky thing, see if I can show you how this works. So if you say cargo new, hello. So we created a binary application called hello, very good. So let's have a look at that. Sorry, the uh, screen's a bit laggy, so it's not the easiest thing to type on. But we have a directory, then we can see what's in the directory. We have a, uh, a main source file, which looks promising, and a, uh, a cargo.toml file. The cargo.toml file is the uh, configuration for the package that you're in. So Cargo has created a package, which is this binary application, and then you can configure it using the, the toml file. then we can run it. So it compiles the application, then runs it for you, and prints out the result. 
and it just happens to have built ahead of the world example for you. I was going to edit this and play with it, but actually, I think it's probably better if I just go back to the slides at this point. Uh, but yeah, that's the idea. You can, it, it's almost instant to set up a, a project and get building, and you can edit that file and play around. Let's see. How do I get back to the slides? I think like this. Yeah. Now, Cargo isn't just a uh, build runner, but it's also uh, a package manager. So external dependencies are pulled in through Cargo. It's the same like command. You do Cargo search, and you find a library that you want to use in your application. It's also a test runner, a benchmark runner. It's also a documentation generator, and more. It, it's really quite nice uh, to have uh, all of the tools that you probably uh, find and bundle together in, in your C++ projects, uh, and you, you come up with your own stack of stuff that you put together, so you make and Doxygen and Google test, or you, know, you, you find your own uh, combination of these tools. Uh, here, it, it's all standard, and you, people mostly use the same stuff, and that's also quite nice, because uh, like everyone's uh, aligned around the same tool set. Great. Uh, quickly mention that uh, when you're looking into using Rust, you're going to see that there are different release channels. It's fairly straightforward. You have the stable version, which is updated every six weeks. The beta is the thing that's about to become stable. And nightly is where the new changes uh, are implemented and uh, people play around with like, the new stuff. And this updates every night might be unstable. And you probably don't want to use it unless you want to try the new thing. Uh, but if you, if you do want to try the new things, then uh, you can use Rust up and, and just immediately switch between the, the different tools, uh, tool chains. The other thing that I need to mention, uh, ideally I'll, I wouldn't, but I kind of have to, that <coughs> coming up is the 2018 edition of Rust, which is going to be released in a couple of weeks. And I figured it's close enough in time that I should just be using the 2018 edition. So. The examples you see, you have to use the beta channel or the nightly channel, but in a couple of weeks, it's all going to be uh, stable. Rust 1.0 is now known as the 2015 edition. And yeah. Something that's nice about editions is that uh, it allows the language designers to incrementally introduce breaking changes. So the language can evolve, and then you opt into the breaking changes. And this allows the community and like, the, the user base to come along with improvements to the language while still maintaining combat compatibility with the old changes. These are subtle tweaks, but uh, it, it allows for er ergonomic enhancements, which is quite a nice thing. And uh, in general, though, new features will be available in all editions. All right, so I think that's enough orientation. Uh, so let's see if we can build something. I thought a, an audio application would be nice. And uh, right, we're 20 minutes in, so we've got 25 minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to have to uh, hustle a bit. But uh, OK, so something that's uh, interesting enough but small enough, and I thought maybe a, a Rust version of Freeverb, which is this like, well-known open source uh, like uh, reverb algorithm that's been around since. Uh, 2000 uh, and was made public domain there. And it's everywhere. You find it in tons of different uh, software packages, but I didn't see a Rust version, so I thought that might be a nice thing to uh, work on. And we can go through like how the whole thing is put together pretty quickly because it's extremely simple. That is uh, like the, the structure of the algorithm. You have a stack of uh, comb filters that have internal feedback and filtering. They're summed together and then passed through a series of all-pass filters. Uh, so the, uh, this is for one channel, then you duplicate the structure for the other channel and like, do some mixing, and then you have a stereo reverb. Um, the, uh, the image comes from a, a write-up that uh, Julius Smith has on the Karma website where uh, he talks about the structure, analyzes the properties of it, and that's worth reading. And you can find the original source code, which uh, I've converted into Rust, uh, following the link below. Uh, they're easy to find on Google if you don't have time to, uh, if, you know, you, you'll find it. <laughs> Easy enough. So it, it's easy to build this. We only need two things, really, a comb filter and an all-pass filter. They, uh, uh, so we will create a library first. So uh, instead, so we use cargo new lib. And instead of a main RS, we now have a lib RS. So this package that we've just created is a library, which we're then going to reuse in a couple of different applications. So the comb filter and the all-pass filter both uh, use delay lines. And 
We can create a de delay line. We've made a new file here, delayline.rs, inside our Freeverb library. And this, imp this implicitly creates a delay line module. And so I, like, uh, I'll be referring to the delay line module here. Uh, inside the module, we've created a delay line struct. So this is the same thing, essentially, as a C struct. Uh, pub means that it's public outside of this module. And we have two elements in our struct, a buffer and an index. The buffer is a vec of 64-bit floats. Index u size, u size is essentially stood size t in C++ terms. To add uh, methods to this type, we don't do that in line in the type like you would in C++, but we separate the behavior out into implementations. And the, the default implementation by convention, we'll usually include a static method called new. This isn't a constructor, or it, it's not like the new keyword. It doesn't allocate anything unless you happen to be well, using a vector here. That will allocate, but uh, new is just a convention. Uh, we don't have constructors in Rust. Uh, instead, it, there's an expectation that whenever you have a, a delay line value, it has been fully initialized. And however you achieve that is, is up to you, but the convention is new. So we're initializing a buffer with a zeroed out uh, like a string of zeros and uh, an index of zero. Then adding some methods. Here we, you see uh, a, a class method essentially is uh, a method in an implementation that uh, has a reference to self as the first parameter. This is like the, the, the this pointer in C++. Um, so we have a, a read method that returns the current currently index value in the buffer, and we have a write and advance method, which takes a value, it sticks it in the buffer, and then it uh, increments the index or wraps around if we're at the end. And so then we just have a continuously uh, like circling uh, uh, delay line. We can show that with a test. So here we've added a unit test that's in the same module uh, in a child module called tests. Uh, and the config test uh, command here is a compiler declaration that uh, says you only need to worry about building this if we're building tests. And then we have a length 10 function which we tag with the test uh, declaration. And uh, this is now registered as a, as a unit test. Uh, so we uh, create a delay line with 10 elements, shove a bunch of numbers in, uh, and expect to be able to read them back out on the next time round. Then if we run cargo test, uh, it will find this test and then run it and tell us that everything's okay. So something I, I really like about this is writing the test with the code. I think this is uh, like quite a nice way of working that they're in the same module in context uh, of, of the code that they're testing. And yeah, having, a, having like a, a test framework, a test runner out of the box is also really nice. There's, there's no setup cost here. The all pass filter, well, we're going to create a new module, all pass, and use the delay line that we've just created, stick it in a struct. That's all the all pass needs, the delay line. Then uh, we initialize it, and the tick function is like, reading a value out, mixing it with the input, uh, <coughs> like, applying some gain, and then putting it back in the delay line. And it's all pass-ish, I think, is, is how it would be described. It's not exactly an all pass, but it's, it's what Freeverb uh, algorithm calls an all pass. Uh, the comb filter uh, is slightly more sophisticated. Again, it's a delay line with uh, feedback, but uh, here we have some filter state. There's a, a one pole filter embedded in this. And uh, like here's the tick function. We're again reading a value out from the delay line, applying some filtering, and then uh, putting it back into the delay line and returning the output. So tick here is just a, the method name that I'm using for these DSP blocks that uh, take an a sample of input and then give you a sample of output. Uh, that's just a name that I've chosen. Putting it together, uh, we then have uh, like a free verb module and a free verb struct in the module. And here we see that we're using our all passes and combs that we just created. And on, uh, we have eight pairs of combs and four pairs of all passes. Uh, th this pair syntax, this is actually tuple syntax. They can be like n elements long, but like, this is good enough for, uh, for this purpose, I think, that you just have a pair left and right, and then a bunch of other state, like for, for different parameters that are uh, 
used. In the uh, new constructor, we, uh, sorry, the new method, we're uh, initializing our combs using these uh, like uh, delay lengths that have been carefully tuned by the original author, and uh, you'll find in the source code. Uh, and same here with the all classes. Then a bunch of stuff, and you have a free verb that is ready to go. So that's fully initialized, and uh, like, yeah, sounds like a reverb. The uh, tunings look like this, so you can have constants, and the syntax there is just put them all in caps, and fine, it's a convention. Uh, we're adjusting the length because the original only support 44.1. I, I think that does the job. I haven't really tested it that much, but so. Uh, Something to show here. Okay, it's a bunch of setters for the free verb. <clears throat> the only different thing here that you haven't seen so far is that a private method is just a function in an implementation that isn't public. So uh, these two setters are publicly available. They defer to a helper, which is private. I just figured I'd show that. Then the, the tick function, <clears throat> we take the input, uh, the stereo input, sum it to mono, uh, pass it into each of the uh, stereo pairs of combs sum all of that together, run through the all passes, and then the output is a bit of stereo mixing plus the uh, dry signal. Oh, the thing that's new here is tuple access is dot zero for left, dot one for right, if you see what I mean. That's the, the zeroth element of the tuple, the, the first element of the tuple, the one, I don't know what you call that. Yeah, so that, that's it. That <coughs> at this point, we have the complete algorithm defined for the free verb. <coughs> so then, uh, does it work? How does it sound? Well, let's try it. Let's see if we can get this to work. I think what we can say is run. That sounds promising. You can hear that that's actually applying reverb to the signal. I've got a, a drum loop playing in the background over here. You know, that, that's playing, it's passing through Soundfire into the application that has default input, default output selected, and then, yeah, then you have that is Rust code processing audio. Oh. Oh. It, it gets better. <laughs> Uh, okay, so there we had an application that was uh, like a full audio application with a GUI. How did we put that together? Well, uh, I'm using existing libraries uh, that happen to have Rust wrappers. So I, I was able to pull them in as uh, like dependencies into the application project very easily, which I'll show you now. Uh, our main function, uh, I'm calling run main. You don't have to worry about this template -y syntax for now. I'm going to explain this, but for now, the thing that's... Uh, Interesting is that we're creating a, uh, a command queue using uh, the uh, external crate crossbeam. So this is a dependency that I'm pulling in. This is a Rust library. Uh, and then I'm using port audio for audio in and out. It, it does the job. Uh, and here we're, we're spawning a thread where the audio will run. And then that thread receives the command receiver. And then on the sender side, we have UI widgets. Uh, I'm not going to show you everything, but like you get the idea. I'm uh, using a GTK window here and GTK wind widgets, um, and this this just works. It's, it 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 feels straightforward to use. That you don't have to worry about this too much. Uh, the the way that you declare these dependencies is in your cargo.toml in the dependencies section. You <clears throat> say, okay, I want version 0.5 of GTK, 0.7 of Port Audio. Uh, the thing that's interesting here is that I've included two internal dependencies for things I haven't shown you yet, uh, <coughs> uh, one called audio module and the other called free verb module. And I really didn't need to do this, but I figured it would be good for the talk to show a bit of a more sophisticated uh, application than, than, than just basic setters. So I, I started making a module framework, and I'm not, not sure it's the best idea, but it gets to, it gets to uh, uh, a nice feature of Rust, which is traits. And uh, traits are very similar to uh, virtual interfaces in C++. They're also very similar to 
concepts, which are coming in C++20, I think. Uh, and they uh, allow for um, like diff different, different behaviors, depending on what you do with them. But really, if you think of it as declaring an interface, and then how you use that interface is uh, something that will become a bit clearer. So here we're saying an audio module is a parameter provider. So it, uh, that's another trait. There is a trait called parameter provider, and the trait audio module also includes that trait as part of its interface. Uh, the audio module declares a processor type, and the processor type meets the, it, it satisfies the interface of audio processor. And then it also has a method called create processor, which, uh, when given a sample rate, gives you uh, a, a processor by value. The audio processor trait, I've got defined it as like being something that processes stereo uh, audio. So we have an, uh, an input buffer and an output buffer. The syntax here you haven't seen yet. This is like an array, but it's um, uh, sized at runtime. So this is like a std spam that's coming in C++. So it's, it's just a, a reference plus a length. Uh, and that's the standard syntax for it. Uh, the audio processor, we expect to also be able to handle commands. And so you can uh, compose these traits together and create a full declaration of an interface, which on its own doesn't do anything, but uh, can then be used uh, for cases like this. So we, uh, I created a new module, Freeverb module, which uh, then has a Freeverb processor, which internally has the Freeverb uh, struct that we made that does the ticking, uh, but we're, we're kind of encapsulating that here. Uh, and then we implement audio processor and the process stereo method for it. And uh, in, instead of ticking sample by sample, uh, here we're dealing with a buffer, so we have to iterate over the buffer. And what this is doing is taking the indices, uh, or the even indices up to the input length, and then using uh, uh, those even indices to give access to the interleaved stereo data in the buffer. I could have maybe explained that clearer, but uh, I think you get the idea. It's interleaved audio, so you need to take left, right, left, right, left, right, and we do that by stepping by two over the indices. Then we tick the input, get some output, and assign it to the output. How am I doing for time? Not great. OK, I'm going to start skipping over. Uh, I wanted to show here also, so the parameter trait here that I didn't show you yet, but uh, this uh, uh, is now being used in this context uh, for uh, dynamic polymorphism. So the parameter provider, given an ID, will give you a parameter which we don't know about at compile time, but we do know about at runtime. And uh, it becomes a, what's called a trait object in C++. I guess this would be a virtual object. So it has a V table, and this object is stored in a box, which in C++ terms is a unique pointer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead a bit. Uh, so we have a Freeverb module that declares some parameters, and there's a whole thing about that. But it, I, get, I think we get the idea. Command handler uh, is a trait. That it, we have to handle commands. And then uh, so the processor receives a command and then calls the relevant setter on the processor. So now coming back to the main function, I think we, we see what's going on here. Like I, I wanted to separate out the, the free verb uh, aspects of the application from the, the, the thing that actually runs the, uh, runs the system. So like we just pass in a module which implements the trait audio module. So it, the, the whole application doesn't know anything about free verb. It just knows about audio modules. So then maybe it could be reused for uh, other effects. So traits are generic type constraints similar to C++20's concepts, also offer static polymorphism uh, functionality, also dynamic polymorphism similar to C++ virtual objects. And uh, having like the same uh, language feature providing all of this functionality is, is really quite remarkable, I think, and uh, like, it's one of my favorite things about Rust. So I'm going to have to rattle on. Uh, right, so F5. Yeah. Linking against C libraries in Rust is well supported. Uh, crates are available for many major C libraries and also C++ libraries that happen to have C bindings. Uh, if you find that a crate doesn't have a Rust wrapper, then making a Rust wrapper would be a nice contribution to the ecosystem. So if you uh, felt so inclined, that would be a, a really good thing to be spending time on. 
Uh, how is it uh, possible to call C code given Rust safety restrictions? This is an important question. Rust is very strict, C code is not. If we're calling into C code, then uh, how does Rust allow this? Uh, so it, to, to quickly highlight uh, how this is possible, we have the unsafe keyword, which tells Rust, I know what I'm doing, <laughs> just <laughs> don't worry about what I'm about to do here with memory or, or like lifetimes or whatever. Like it, you can just bypass the whole of the, all of the safety checks, or most of them, um, if you need to. And when you need to, it might be when you're working with a C library that uh, communicates in raw pointers. Uh, and if you're using unsafe, you probably want to abstract it away. It, I think it, it's very rare that you'll actually see much uh, unsafe code in the, in the client code that you're writing. If you're writing unsafe code, probably you're building a library. So we've seen using C in Rust. How could we use Rust in C++? Well, uh, it, the way that you do this is that you uh, build a, a static library or a dynamic library if you prefer and you, uh, uh, you apply attributes to the functions in your library uh, to ensure that they're uh, exposed in a, in a C-compatible way. So here we're creating a new library, free, lib C libs, uh, free verb C libs, and it depends on our free verb library that we created earlier, and we're telling Cargo, please build it as a static library. In the Rust code for this library, uh, we have a create and destroy method where we're able to create a raw pointer to a free verb struct, which we essentially forward declare for uh, the purposes of C. So we, we, we tell C there is this struct. You can allocate it, but we'll take care of the details. And here we're using box to allocate it on the heap, and then it uh, gets returned as a raw pointer. And on the destroy side, then we receive a, a, a pointer that we just have to hope is <coughs> not null. And uh, it, we tag it as unsafe. It's like the, the, the thing that comes in here could be anything, but we fingers crossed and it will be okay. Also, no mangle, and that that's pretty much all you need to <coughs> make sure that, oh, extern. So it's no mangle and extern. Make sure that that function's available outside. So once you build that, you have a library that can be linked into your C++ application, but you also need a header, or you know the declarations of the things that you're trying to access. Uh, you can write that by hand if you want. Uh, there's also a tool cbindgen which will generate uh, a header for you from the Rust library. And uh, I used that here and you get a, uh, like a, a regular C++ header speaking in types that uh, C++ understands. Uh, I can skip over this. We have a process function, inputs and outputs and uh, ticking. And we get this kind of C interface. using the free verb Rust library in a juice project. Right, so now we have a C library. We can use it in C++, and because this is a, an audio conference, I guess there's a lot of juice developers here, so this is how you do it in Producer. You tell, uh, you, you set the, the right flags, and the flags you need are uh, uh, where, where the header is. Uh, so it's in this uh, C, C lib folder local to the juice project. Uh, you tell it where the library is, you tell it which library you want to link against. To make this nice, you can create a pre-build script uh, that takes care of compiling the Rust library and generating the header for you. And this works pretty nicely. Uh, then in our, our juice code, I'll, right, I'll move quickly, uh, we have freeverb.hpp. Uh, I didn't do the whole module thing in the juice uh, uh, example, uh, but what we have is a unique pointer to a free verb, and when it gets destroyed, we need to call the uh, free verb destroy function. When we are preparing to play, we create a free verb using our create function, and we, uh, we stick it into our unique pointer to hold on to it. Then when we're processing an audio book, well, we have a command queue and we we set our parameters uh, as necessary, and then uh, we call freeverb process with our instance of the freeverb. Now, let's see, does that work? Well, here is the juice project. Hey. So, this is the same DSP that's implemented in Rust, running a running in a juice 
very basic, but yeah, it works. And, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it, it, uh, ooh, wait a minute. Okay, let's go. Hold on. How do we get to the slides? It's like this. Right, so it, now, now you, you're in a Juice project, so you could build a VST with this or you know, whatever you want to do with your, your Juice project. Uh, another target uh, that's interesting is uh, WebAssembly. And with Rust, the, the tool chain for generating WebAssembly is pretty nice. And uh, we're going to follow the same approach here, creating a, another wrapper library. In this case, I've called it WASM. Uh, and in, in this case, WASM bindgen is the tool that we're using rather than C bindgen. And here we, we tag our uh, uh, objects and methods that we want to uh, like expose using this WASM bindgen uh, attribute. Um, so this is a slightly different approach to the C approach, but uh, I, it's pretty straightforward, really. Uh, the process function is very similar to what we've seen before, but now we're speaking in native Rust types because WASM Bindgen knows a bit more about Rust and it can uh, like uh, expose the correct uh, types for the, the JavaScript that ends up being called, or the, the WebAssembly that ends up being called. So it's much the same as you've seen before. Then uh, the way that this is compiled, well, we use cargo build, but we tell it to target uh, WebAssembly instead of whatever your platform is compiling for. Uh, and then you run WASM bind gen. Uh, you tell it where your WebAssembly is, and then it gives you a, a, a set of files. It gives you some JavaScript bindings, which I wouldn't show you. Uh, it gives you WebAssembly in, in the correct place. And it also gives you uh, some debug symbols for TypeScript, which uh, I'm not a front-end developer, so I wouldn't know what to do with. But I can put them on a slide for you, because they're much more readable than the other files. And that shows you the, the shape of what uh, WASM bind gen is outputting. Uh, then I don't have time to show you how to hook this up, but it, we're just using Web Audio. We, instance, we import the, the WebAssembly, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then we create a script processor. This isn't the, uh, the, the modern way to do a custom DSP for the web, but it's slide friendly. So there we have uh, the, the input and output, and we're calling uh, process on our free verb object, um, connect it to a microphone, and then connect it to the output hook up some sliders, and then then, yeah, this looks familiar. What will it do? Hey. So again, that's the same DSP that we wrote at the start of the talk, and now we've uh, used it in a Juice project, and we're using it in the web, which I think is pretty decent. <laughs> right, thank you. No, okay, it, it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> uh, Rust and other languages. Okay, to summarize, uh, exposing Rust to C is easy via C bind gen. Exposing Rust code to JavaScript is easy via WASM bind gen. I'm making the claim easier. I think it's straightforward. Uh, there's a few details to figure out, but like it, it's there. Like the, the tool chain is there, and uh, like uh, it, you can you can use it. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, it's fine. <laughs> you can do it. You can you can you you've totally got it. Uh, is anything missing? Right. So this is the wrap up now, and uh, we've got five minutes left. So I'm going to rattle through this, and then maybe there's time for a couple of questions. So uh, it, SIMD support is in, it's stable. Uh, the intrinsics are available. Uh, it, it, there, are, it, there is a crate now which is building a, a nice uh, abstraction over the low-level uh, operations. There's also an effort to create a, a standard uh, abstraction for the low-level intrinsics. Um, const generics is still work in progress, but it's coming soon. Uh, it, what this means is in C++, you could say a static vector of Ts, and there are n, n as a maximum uh, number for your static vector. And you can't express that in Rust. At the moment, you have to use macros or uh, workarounds. Uh, but I would really like this feature, and it's, it's coming soon. Uh, inline assembly is still work in progress. Uh, it, it's unstable, uh, but gated, uh, and maybe will change. Uh, fast math intrinsics are nightly only. They're not stable, and I think these are quite important. 
uh, but hopefully they'll come soon and maybe some people in the audience here would be able to help the, the Rust community figure out how to do this well. Uh, placement new was in Nightly is not anymore. They, they have things to figure out there. Uh, what's not great? Well, compile times are getting better. Like they, they, they were not great. Uh, they, they're decent enough now, I think. Like I, they, I find it usable unless I'm using a particular crate that is slow to compile, but then uh, maybe I don't use that crate. I'd, I'd say if, you, if you're building complex C++ applications, you won't notice things are dramatically slower. You'll be, you'll be okay with the compile times in Rust. If you're writing more like low-level C style code, then maybe you'll find it unbearable, but yeah, you, sh you should try it out and see what you think. Uh, incomplete iOS support. Uh, there is an issue with compiling to iOS bitcode, which maybe you need for the, the App Store. Uh, apparently, there are ways of making it work. Uh, I haven't tried it. Uh, there's a long issue that you can read uh, to describe this. But if iOS support is important to you, then you should really look into this. What is great? Safety is great. Ergonomics of the language are very nice. Traits are wonderful. Uh, having a standard tool, tool chain that everyone uses is great. I think if we could take it in C++, if we could take something from Rust, this is the thing that's kind of low-hanging fruit, like creating standard tool chains that everyone can like rally around and, and get, get, get some traction behind. I think this would be really good for people learning the language and, and coming into the language. Um, debugging Visual Studio Code. I didn't get to show you this, but if you have Visual Studio Code, then uh, the Rust community have kind of chosen that as their standard IDE, and it seems. I don't know, that's a, a big claim, but like, that's the thing to use, and debugging works really well, breakpoints and inspecting symbols and values and everything. The Rust book is brilliant. You should read it. It will give you a, a full orientation of the language, and uh, it's very well written. Uh, the, the, the communication uh, effort that uh, is uh, part of the community, I think, is fantastic and, and worth studying. <laughs> Really good, and in general, the community is great. Get involved; like they, they would uh, love to have you. Like I think the more people involved in real-time audio who are uh, working in the community, the more things will be built. And at the moment, there's not so many people doing this stuff, and so there's a few like places where just tools that you need don't exist yet. And you know, maybe making those tools would be a good contribution, and maybe you know how to. So it would be a good thing to do. A, a couple of projects worth looking at. Uh, Ralph Levine did a talk last week at a meetup and uh, presented his work on building an open source synthesizer in Rust. It's looking really promising and interesting, and uh, if you, you're looking for a thing to contribute to, then this would be a good place to start. Also, there's a group of people who are interested in building VSTs with Rust, and they're working on a project there that's worth checking out. All right, so that's it. Thanks for listening. You can find the code examples at github.com slash irh slash freeverb dash rs. And there's also going to be an ADC 2018 branch there, which will capture the current state. Because I think I'm going to keep working on it. But like, if you want to see the state of the code as it was when this talk was done, then there'll be a branch. Also on Twitter, I'm underscore Hobson underscore. And I should probably mention that the company I work for, Ableton, is hiring, especially for C++ engineers. And you can look at our uh, positions at ableton.com slash jobs. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. So I think we've probably got time for a couple of questions. There's one here. Uh, first question, is there manual control over function inlining in Rust? Uh, oh, I... And uh, second, you mentioned uh, debugging. Uh, if I write a C++ application with some pieces in Rust, can I just debug it like using existing tools? Uh, the first question, in inlining? Um, Line in C++, basically. I don't know. I didn't check. That seems like a, a, a good thing to have. I, I would imagine they've thought about that. Uh, it, if it exists, it will be easy to find. And if it doesn't, then uh, you'll find a long discussion about why they haven't added it. <laughs> uh, uh, that's generally the way these things go. Like They, they, they see these problems and, and discuss them in depth. And it's all in the open and uh, easy to find. So it, it, the, the simple answer is I don't know. But like it, it, <laughs> I think it's a, a really good question. The, the second question and was... Can you already debugging. practically debug mixed applications written like partially in C++, partially in Rust, using existing tools, Windows, Mac? Uh, you should be able to, yeah. The, the debug symbols are like in the standard format, and uh, I haven't tried that, but I, I would anticipate that, that that is something we could... We could give it a go after the talk, if you like. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see if it works. <laughs> cool. Anyone else? Going once. Okay, cool. Well, thanks very much, Ian. And Thank we've you. got a <laughs> breakout.